Hello, everyone. Welcome to the recorded version of the tale of Ivan and the Grey Wolf, or Ivan and the Firebird. Um, my name is James Haddad, and I'm a Rites of Passage Council guide. And this is a re recording. Uh, for those of you that listened last night, you'll know that the story uh, leapt out of my consciousness <laughs> and uh, I struggled to get it back. And I did. Um, and I've been thinking about that this morning. And so I spoke with Cater and um, offered to re record the story so that we could uh, have it in one fell swoop without the breakout rooms and without any of the um, kerfuffle, as I want to say. So thank you for listening. Um, the first thing I'll do is uh, talk about story just a little bit, which is what we did last night. Um, if any of you have heard any of these uh, rites of passage, council, wintertime stories, you'll know that um, we often start with a conversation about what story is. And, and story, of course, lives and breathes um, as a being inside of each of us differently. Um, and so my way of presenting how it lives and breathes inside of me is, is mine. Um, and then you can take that um, uh, how, how you will and, and internalize it. And I'll also share with you some of the things that Cater has, has shared with me and with many of the guides at Rice Passage Council around story and, uh, and pass on his teachings as well. Um, and so what is story? Um, you know, story in some sense, I think of it as a prism. Um, and you know what happens when you hold a prism up to the light is it, it reflects and refracts the light into a rainbow, right? Um, and so story, you know, all of that is held in that little prismatic core. Um, and you can also think of story as a seed, you know, um, and what happens with the seed is the whole life cycle of this plant um, is held within it. And all it needs is the right conditions, um, soil, water, sun, time, and it sprouts and grows and creates another seed. Um, and prism reflects and refracts that light into the rainbow. Um, and the rainbow is it's beautiful in some ways because it has associations with Iris in, in Spanish, your rainbow is Arco Iris. Um, and Iris was the goddess, the messenger goddess, sort of the equivalent of Hermes in some ways uh, in the Olympian pantheon and the Greek pantheon. And so we'll call her in, we'll call Iris in uh, as that prismatic carrier of story and hope to bring her with us um, and hope to go with her and hope that we travel together well in this way. So, so th those are some thoughts on story. Uh, Robert Bly has a lot of thoughts on story as well. Great poet and storyteller. And he talks about story as a, as a way of a culture, just like a seed um, keeps the plant's genetic DNA um, and the history of its adaptations to its biological environment through time in it. Um, a story is a way of a culture um, encoding its its cultural adaptations um, and ways of being and ways of becoming, uh, ways of becoming human, ways of becoming a part or a member of that culture, of that group, um, ways of dealing with certain situations, archetypal uh, situations that might present themselves to someone. Um, and if stories are told and in oral culture, stories were told all the time, all the time. And, and you know, if we think we don't rely on or listen to stories all the time, we're kidding ourselves, right? I mean, look at the movie industry, look at, look at um, the stories of Harry Potter, which are of course archetypal and kids just line up my kid, my 11 year old boy loves, loves those stories as do many children. Um, and those are just kind of a, a, new, a new branch on an old root, you know? Um, those archetypal stories that give us direction, um, that give us meaning, that give us, a sense of being part of something larger than ourselves. Um, and so all of that can be encoded in story and, and is encoded in story and especially in fairy tales. 
um, which no one wrote down, right? I mean, somebody wrote them down, somebody collected them, but, but, but no one is, is attributed the authorship of those. They're somehow akin to collective dreaming, um, like this collective unconsciousness that, that um, has been sort of given and re-given and told and retold um, for thousands of years. And this story, Ivan the Firebird from Russia was, you know, we call, we call it Russia now, but it was before Russia, um, this story was around. Before the Slavic nations were called the Slavic nations, this story was around. So um, it's an old ancestral lineage, a passed down thing. Um, and in, in, in some ways I feel like story is also, um, you know, something that we ride on, on some level. You know, there's this old shamanic notion that the drum, you know, boom, 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 boom. That drum is what we ride when we're doing shamanic journey work. Well, a story is a way of, in my view, um, riding. A story is a vehicle um, that we can ride into these presences, um, into these understandings, into these ways of um, viewing our lives in the context of a greater life. Um, and when we come back from that experience, if we've allowed ourselves to open to the story, then we often find that we have, or at least I do, find that I have a new way of looking at certain things in my life. Um, and we can, at the end of the story, we'll, we'll do something similar to this and we'll, um, we'll talk a little bit about some of the images, some of the archetypal motifs, and some of the questions um, and, and, and sort of food um, that we can can access the milk that we can access um, from the stories. Steiner, Rudolf Steiner said that stories are soul milk. And, uh, and this story in particular is a type of milk that is a wolf milk, kind of wild milk. Um, and, and so we'll talk about um, this story as well in terms of initiation. Um, what we do at Rice of Passage Council is, is facilitate um, initiatory experiences primarily for people. Um, and those experiences um, are often, you know, positioned in a direction and those stories are often positioned in a direction and that direction is most usually down. Um, and the reason it's down is because there's a fall, there's a descent, there's a loss of something. Um, a rite of passage, you know, if you're going to break it up into like thematic elements, um, a rite of passage can also be considered a prism and then the light goes through and there's this rainbow and, and there's four particular motifs um, or passages that one would go through in a rite of passage. Um, there's the severance, there's the call, there's the threshold, and there's the return. And so, um, this story particularly has all of those motifs in it. And so that's why we call it um, an initiatory story. Um, each of us, I'm sure, has had these experiences in our lives um, where we are severed from something that we love, that we loved, that we did not want to lose, um, whether it be an aspect of ourselves or whether it be a physical connection. Um, something dear to us that we've lost, a home that burned to the ground, um, a home that we lost due to foreclosure or bankruptcy, um, a child that we've lost, a parent or a friend, um, or a marriage, um, or an important relationship or a pet. All of these things would be um, considered a severance. And what we do in initiatory work um, and what Cater has been teaching us to do and, and what he is so good at and, and what the old traditions of initiatory rites of passage are, and instead of pathologizing these experiences, we mythologize them. And we do that through um, contextualizing, contextualizing them in, in story and in um, ceremony and in ritual. And so, um, you know, an example from my own life is that, you know, uh, the severance that I went through, the largest severance of the last number of years was a divorce. And, and 
the first day that I realized like really deeply in my bones that that was what was coming. I think I, I think I, I put it off for a long time, that realization and, and it just hit me. Um, and that was the same day I read Odysseus's mythic descent into Hades, into the underworld. Um, and that, I, I would say that story, the Odyssey and, um, and my ability to frame what I was going through, um, through the lens of that story and realizing that that story was an archetypal story um, with many motifs, um, an initiatory story with many motifs, uh, saved my life, you know, because I realized, okay, I'm going into the underworld. This is what this is. It's a severance. And, um, and it's exactly where I'm supposed to be. Stories sort of let me know that it's an, it's an archetypal. And by that, I mean, sort of universal, um, and deeply embedded in the, in the hummingness of being human, um, sort of what we grapple with, forces that are larger than us that sort of have us um, and that we are moved by. That's, that's what we can conceive of as archetypes, almost like dormant seeds, potentials that awaken when certain experiences in our lives bring us there. Um, and then if we're open to that awakening, then we're called oftentimes. And so instead of pathologizing, right, we mythologize. And so there's the severance and then there's the call. And after the call, um, if, if we heed the call, we don't have to heed the call. You know, we can refuse the call and then some other things happen. We're usually severed and called again. Um, it's a cycle that repeats itself. But um, if we heed the call um, to new life, and we are then placed in a threshold um, and that would be the next phase of the initiatory journey. Um, the, threshold, the, the threshold passage is one where we, um, where we lose who we were um, and we're not yet who we will be. We're in this, as Cater says, betwixt and between place. Um, and that place, can last for days, it can last for months, it can last for years um, until we sort of integrate the lessons um, that we're meant to integrate through that experience. And then there's the return, uh, the nostos in Greek, um, this notion of Odysseus coming back to Ithaca um, to reclaim his kingdom. Um, and the return is often the hardest part of the journey. The return is that part of the journey where we've come back changed and yet we still have to go on our grocery runs. We still have to take our kids to soccer. We still have to interact with our ex spouses. We still have to interact with their in-laws. We still have to interact with, you know, picking up the dog poop, all these mundane things, you know, um, that we have to come back to. And, and yet somehow we're essentially different. And so that question of how to integrate those differences um, from the threshold space, from the numinous, from the epiphany of the god or goddess um, that comes and, and tears you out of your old life um, and, and places you in a new life. You know, we say that in initiatory experiences, the flow of time is backwards. It begins with a death and ends with a birth. Um, and that and, and that death is the severance and that birth is the return. Um, and so just like any birth, there's birth pains, there's difficulties. And then also just like any birth of a new being, there's this time that, you know, when you plant a new seed and the cotyledons come out and, and then the true leaves come out um, and before the root system is established, you have to water and tend and nurture that plant really well, just like a baby has to be nurtured. Um, really well fed, looked after, changed. Um, and that feeding and that looking after and that changing changes us. Um, and some of the ways that we interacted with the world prior to being parents um, are gone now, right? We can't go out dancing on a Friday night like we might what once have done. We can't go see all the shows we might have once done um, or once have seen. And so just like that, when we're kind of nursing our own new life back, 
um, there is an attending to that is required. Um, and the more that we attend to it, um, just like with a plant, the more it seems to offer us. And so um, that's a lot of talk about story um, and about um, initiatory rites of passage. And, um, you know, the one last thing I'll say that Cater talks about is um, how to listen to a story and how to pay attention to a story. And Cater says often that it's not really important that we understand a story. A story is a living thing. And so if we understand it, in some sense, it's dead. Um, it's stopped moving or working in our lives. The point is to have a relationship with the story. And the point is to give it our attention. And the point is to pay attention to where in the story we are drawn and caught, where in the story we've stayed for longer periods in time, lingered uh, around certain energies or moods or words, um, where in the story we lose the story, where in the story we, like I did last night, completely and totally the story just leaves leaves my mind leaves our consciousness so if we can find those things and and pay attention to those things then then there's 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 messages there for us there's a reflection there for us and so um and so yeah that's what we'll do we'll um we'll continue now with with the story of Ivan in the grave and before the, we do that I'll read a poem I'm going to pause the recording for one second and and get the poem and uh, resume the recording and read it. And then we'll go into the story. Thanks so much for being here. All right, everybody. So this is a poem um, called Exercise by W.S. Merwin, um, whom I uh, deeply love and admire. I think it was a former poet laureate of the U.S. And uh, this is a, a poem I find helps me get in the mood for opening to story. So exercise. First, forget what time it is for an hour. Do it regularly every day. Then forget what day of the week it is. Do this regularly for a week. Then forget what country you are in and practice doing it in company for a week. Then do them together for a week with as few breaks as possible. Follow these by forgetting how to add or to subtract. It makes no difference. You can change them around after a week. Both will help you later to forget how to count. Forget how to count. Starting with your own age, starting with how to count backward, starting with even numbers, starting with Roman numerals, starting with fractions of Roman numerals, starting with the old calendar, going on to the old alphabet, going on to the alphabet, until everything is continuous again. Go on to forgetting elements, starting with water, proceeding to earth, rising in fire. Forget fire. Okay. So, once upon a time, once upon a rhythm and a pulse, where everything was continuous once again, that we now call time. Once upon that rhythm and pulse where everyone who lived, lived in accordance with their own true nature. Where everyone lived in that larger rhythm and pulse. That becoming time, that time when everything happened as if for the first time, even when it happened again, in a continuous rhythm like that, in a time like that, there was a kingdom. It was a beautiful kingdom, a beautiful landscape, with beautiful people, beautiful clouds drifting against the backdrop and 
beautiful fields rising fresh in the sun. And in that kingdom, the Lord of the land was known as the white czar. And the white czar had three sons. His first, his eldest was named Dimitri. His second, his middle son was named Vasily. And his third, his youngest was named Ivan, which means John in English, Ivan. And as beautiful as this land was, the palace was just as beautiful that the king dwelt in with his children. And as beautiful as this palace was, even more amazing was the garden in the very center of the palace. And this was a garden that had within it beautiful flowers, beautiful flowering trees and vines and shrubs from all over the world. Scents from India in the East, scents from Ireland in the West, all mingled together in the, this garden of wonders and delight. And the most wonderful part of the garden was the very center. And in the very center of the garden grew a very special tree. It was an apple tree, but it wasn't just an ordinary apple tree. It was a tree that bore golden apples. And this was where the king could be found each evening around the gloaming, that period of betwixt and between, that threshold time where the sun of the day melts into the moon of the night and consciousness rides on something not altogether human. That is where the king would go and he would sit under his apple tree and marvel at the golden apples, his heart filled with contentment and serenity and peace. But it so happened that the king would love to count his apples. And this was just a pastime of his. One day he noticed some apples were missing. And he was vexed by this, but he thought, oh, maybe it's an anomaly. He came back the next evening, more apples missing. Hmm, he thought, well, this is something. And he was sorely vexed. And so he took to coming in the morning. And the next morning, more apples were missing. And so he called his sons to him, Dmitri, Vasily, and Ivan. And he said, sons, something is happening to the apple tree in the center of the kingdom, in the center of our palace, in the center of our garden, in the center of my heart. There, the golden apples are being stolen. And I do not know what is stealing or whom is stealing these golden apples. And so I task you, beautiful sons, with finding out the thief and bringing him to me or her to me or them to me. And his first son, Dimitri, being bold and wanting to secure his father's blessing, said, I will do this for you, father. I will go and I will find this thief and I will bring this thief to you. So his father said, all right, go, go have at it. Dimi. And so that night around the gloaming, um, Dimitri set out into the garden and found himself a nice, comfortable spot to sit hidden where he could have a good vantage of the apple tree and, uh, and waited and waited for the thief to appear. One hour passed, two hours passed, you know, night was coming on, and the beautiful sense of the garden and the flowers opening, uh, the jasmine on the breeze, the lilacs, the sound of the birds, and Dimitri fell asleep. And in the morning, his father came, and he had woken. And his father looked at the apple tree, and he looked at Dimitri, and he said, well, what have you found out? Who has been stealing the apples? And Dimitri said, father, I stayed awake all night 
and no one came. No one came. It is a mystery. And his father looked at the apple tree, noticing some apples were missing, and he looked at Dimitri, and he said nothing. And so Vasily, the second son, wanted to prove his worth and wanted to catch this thief. And so the second night, Vasily went out into the garden. Just as Dimitri had done, he found a spot, a comfortable spot, close to the apple tree where he could see the whole, the whole gestalt from root beginnings to very tippy crowns. And it was that same time of evening, the gloaming. One hour passed, two hour passed, and the garden opening itself to the hands of night and that soft, gentle stirring and that smell of all the plants releasing, releasing their need to hold fast against the father's son and open more gently the mother moon and Dimitri fell, I'm sorry, and Vasily fell asleep. And in the morning, the father came again to the garden and Vasily had awoken and he looked at the apple tree, the white czar, knowing, knowing there were not as many as the day before. And he looked at his son and his son said, father, I'd stayed awake all night and no one has come. Nothing has come. It is a mystery. And his father again looked at the tree and he looked at his son and he shook his head and he said nothing. And now Ivan, the third, the youngest son, wanted to, to try his hand at the thief. And so he set up in the garden, just as his brothers had done before him, in a spot comfortable, beautiful, um, where he could see the whole tree. Uh, and in the gloaming, that eventide time, that time of the twix in between, that time when the plants open and change and become softer and the smells ride on gentle winds. One hour passed, two hours passed, and Ivan noticed he was falling asleep. And he, he, he roused himself and said, no, no, get up, get up. We gotta do this thing. <sighs> okay, he tried that for about 30 minutes and he was falling asleep. So he stood up and he decided to climb the apple tree and stay attached to the tree, knowing that he wouldn't fall asleep because if he did, he would fall out and then he would probably break something, maybe his neck. So he thought, okay, this is what I'll do. I'll climb the tree and I'll position myself close to the top so that if anything comes, I will be able to either reach and grab that person or spring down upon them. And so he did that. And it was dark at this point, past midnight. And Dimitri was waiting. Was, his pulse was quickening. And he was feeling excited. And soon there came a light from the east. And it was as though dawn was arriving six hours too soon. So much light, in fact, was coming from the east, so much like the dawn, that the dawn chorus of the birds in the garden began. Bees came out, birds singing amidst buzzing insects. What was this? And yet, it was as though the sun had wings. It was coming closer and closer and closer, much closer than any sun could come. And as the sun approached, Ivan noticed it was coming right for the garden. And it was this blaze of bright light. And he kept looking and he kept, and sure enough, it was coming right for the apple tree. And it got closer. And finally, Ivan saw is the firebird, the firebird, the firebird, that mythical bird of golden kings, of golden heartedness, of the golden sun, that phoenix being 
is here in my father's garden, stealing the golden apples. For of course, but what does a firebird eat? Gold. What is a firebird composed of? Gold. Gold of the sun. And as that firebird descended onto that tree, and as that firebird landed and alighted on the branch of that tree, Ivan felt the heat of the firebird as though the sun was warming him. He felt the heat in his breast, in his heart. He felt it strongly and he was warmed by it. He was almost in an incantatory reverie, an incantation of warmth. He almost fell out of the tree, <laughs> but he gathered his wits and he slowly approached as quietly as he could the firebird as it was eating and taking the apples. And he leapt and he grabbed the firebird's tail. And the firebirds don't like when their tails are grabbed, let me tell you. And so the firebird was shaking and moving and shimmying. And firebirds are massive creatures. And it was all Yvonne could do to hang on with one hand to the tail of the firebird and the other to the tree. And he knew if he continued to hold on, he would surely die because he would fall out of the tree. But he kept holding. He kept holding, and finally the firebird shook free. But Yvonne hadn't let go, and the firebird and the sun itself, it seemed, flew off, and there was night again in the garden. And yet, there was still a glow in the tree. And Yvonne looked down at his hand, and in it was one single feather of the firebird. And so he climbed down from the tree, and he awaited his father. And in the morning, his father came, he looked at the tree. And before his father could, could even ask Ivan what had happened, Ivan said, Father, father, I know who has been stealing the golden apples. It is the firebird. And here, I caught one of his feathers. I tried as I could to hold on, but I couldn't, father. I'm sorry. But here, take this feather. And his father was overjoyed that Ivan had discovered the thief. And not only that, had, was able to capture it a tail feather of the firebird. And this feather had heat in it and had weight in it. It was, as, it, was though, it was as though it was a mini sun. And the white czar took it in his hand and it, his hand was warmed. And his arm being connected to his hand was warmed and, and his heart being connected to his arm being connected to his hand was warmed. And he smiled and he said, Ivan, this, this, shall be a sigil of our house and an heirloom that we shall pass on from generation to generation. Thank you, Ivan. So he took it into his throne room and he placed it on a column of marble. And, and it cast a golden light in that, thorn, in that throne room and a heat emanated from it. And the king now would sit and stare and be warmed by this tail of the firebird this tail feather of the firebird. Well, Ivan's brothers were not so happy that Ivan had gotten the glory that they had failed to receive. And so they had begun to have a bit of a bitter enmity in their hearts towards Ivan. Why should he succeed where they failed, they thought. And meanwhile, the father was starting to think, you know, I don't just want this tail feather, beautiful as it is, warm and heavy as it is. I want the entire firebird. Mind you, the firebird hadn't been coming back to the garden after Ivan was managed, after Ivan managed to wrestle a feather from its tail. The firebird did not come back. Uh, about a month had passed, and his father called his children to him and said, Children, my sons, I have a task for you. And, and he specifically was talking to Dmitri and to Vasily. Um, and he said, you, you too. How would you like to inherit half of my kingdom while I still live and the other half upon my death? Both of them, both of them looked at each other and, well, yes, of course. Of course, that's what we want. You know, we've been preparing for that. And he said, well, who of you will go out and search of this firebird 
whose tail feather is right over there that your brother Ivan got for me. Who will go bring the firebird back to the white czar's kingdom? And whoever does that will inherit half of the kingdom while I'm alive and the other half when I die. And both Dmitri and Vasily looked at each other and they said, we will go, Father. Of course we will go. We're destined to go. We must go. And so their father gave them his blessing. And he gave them horses. And he gave them the road. And so they set out. And they were gone for a long while. And Ivan, you know, was the youngest son. And he, he also wanted to go. And he begged his father. And his father said, no, Ivan, no, my son. I love you. I love you so much. And you are my only son here that has not gone on this quest. What if something happens to Dimitri? What if something happens to Vasily? Who will inherit the kingdom? Besides that, if you go and we are attacked, who will, who will champion our forces? Who will be the general of our armies? No, no, son, you must stay here. Ivan sort of kicked the dirt a little bit and looked down. His hands were in his pockets. Okay, dad, fine. And so Ivan just busied himself with the things that the youngest children in large mythical castles busy, busy themselves with. Who knows what he was doing? Listening to the latest hip hop music or playing his, his Nintendo Wii, you know, cruising around on his one wheel, uh, kind of being bored, uh, wanting to go on an adventure wanting life to happen, um, the taste for that, the feeling of that still in his hand from the firebird feather. And so he kept going to his father. He kept asking, he kept imploring, he kept begging, he kept bringing his father his favorite foods, you know, playing his father's favorite songs at dinner, you know, hey dad, can I, can I go on this, on this quest? Can I go, can I do this thing that my, my brothers are gone? It doesn't seem like they're having much luck. You know, I mean, they've been gone a while. Like, it's getting late. Like, let's do this, Dad. I got this. His dad kept saying no. But finally, I don't know if any of you all have children. I have an 11-year-old boy and a six-year-old girl. And they can be persistent. <laughs> and it's difficult. <laughs> and they can wear you down. And, uh, and so I think that that's probably what happened to the white czar. Ivan was a persistent one. And he wore his father down. And he said, okay, Ivan, I give you my blessing and I give you a horse, and I give you the road. You too shall go in search of the firebird. You too shall go on this quest. Adventure calls you too, it seems, my son. And so Ivan was stoked. He was excited. He packed all his, all his cool duds, his cool gear. He wanted to look really good for anybody he might meet, any ladies he might meet out there. He got his nice horse that his father had given to him. Who knows how old Ivan was? Maybe he was 16, you know, maybe he was, maybe he was 17, uh, maybe he was 15, maybe he was some, you know, maybe he was 39. You know I mean, you know, you just don't know. Uh, it doesn't say, um, but it, but it does say that he went out, he went forth on the road. Um, and that first day he was riding uh, proud and tall. Um, and, you know, he had his, his iPod, um, well, that's not what they call it. His phone, and he had his earbuds in, and he was listening to, to some adventure music. He had made himself a playlist, an adventure playlist. And, uh, and the first day, he kind of cruised through all the, all the best songs. He was running his horse. He was taking left and right. And he, was, you know, he, was, he was taking out a sword and cutting off the tops of, of, of tall forbs and flowers. You know, he was doing the things that, that uh, one might do when they're on a quest in their, in their, uh, in their adolescence. <laughs> And, and so he camped that first night and then the second night came and, and, uh, you know, he, he wanted to listen to the same playlist, but the, his heart just wasn't into it. It was like, what, 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 but he tried, you know, and he galloped and he tried to muster his courage again and his strength. And he, he cut off the heads of flowers again. And, and, uh, you know, just talking to his horse a lot. Oh, isn't this a grand adventure that we're on? Oh, yes. You're doing well here. And, uh, he camped that night and, uh, and then the third morning he awoke um, and, and, you know, he, he started to get a little, a little downcast. I think Yvonne maybe has a bit of a melancholic temperament. Um, and so he started to listen to his, uh, 
you know, the, the folk songs on the playlist started to come in. A little bit of the sad songs started to come in. The, the nostalgic songs. He started to think about his bed back at the castle and then the warm tea and honey milk that he would get in the evenings and, and the crackling fire and the dogs at his feet and his Nintendo Wii and, you know, all these things that he had to leave behind to go on this adventure that he really, really wanted to go on. Um, but now he's feeling a little bit confused about that. You know, so he camped that third night feeling a little sad and a little afraid, um, a little lonely. Um, but still, he was, he was determined to go on. And so the next morning he woke and he mounted his horse and he rode. And about noon time, he rode into this magnificent mystic forest and uh, the path ended uh, right at a large pillar standing stone, dolmen, a large um, massive stone you know, maybe, maybe 15 feet tall, huge, like a Stonehenge style stone. Um, and it was at a crossroads, right in the center of the crossroads. Uh, the road went to the left, the road went to the right, the road went ahead. Um, and there was the road that, that Yvonne had come down and it all stopped at that crossroads. And Yvonne dismounted his horse and he tied him to a tree not far from the stone. And he went and he examined the stone because he could see that there were some inscriptions on it. He couldn't tell what the inscriptions were. And he went up to them and kind of had to kind of get the dust of years and some of the cobwebs, some beetle larva and you know, other detritus off of these inscriptions. And he could, he could see that there, that, that there was something written. And, and what it said was this, whosoever goes ahead forward on this path, will be cold and hungry. Whosoever goes to the left, his horse will die, but he will live. Whosoever goes to the right, he will die, but his horse will live. And Yvonne thought, oh, shit. What do I do? I'm at a crossroads. Maybe, maybe some of you have been at a crossroads in your lives when you haven't known which way to go, when you haven't known which direction to turn, but, but you know you're at a crossroads where the old life that you were living can't be lived anymore and where there must be a sacrifice of some kind in order for you to continue moving forward, moving on. Um, and so Ivan sat down for a moment and just took a deep breath and didn't know what to do. He was confused in his heart about which direction to turn. Um, and we'll leave him there for one moment and we'll pause the recording. All right, so Ivan is at the crossroads. And, and so Yvonne decides that he will go to the left. And, uh, and so he decides to go to the left. And there he decides all the way. He, he goes for about, you know, this beautiful, beautiful, So Ivan has decided to go to the left. And if you remember in the left, that inscription said, you will live, but your horse will die. So he rides for a full day and in, in, in a sense of anticipation. Um, and a full day goes by and it's about the gloaming again, dusk time. And from out of the shadows, there's a rustling and Ivan and gets a little frightened. And it's a large rustling. And he hears this <clears throat> bit of a growl. And Yvonne gets pretty scared. And, and he, his horse is getting pretty scared. And all of a sudden, this huge gray wolf jumps out 
from the bushes and knocks Ivan off the off of the horse and bites the horse in half. And the horse is dead. And Ivan is weeping bitter tears. And the wolf runs off and Ivan gathers himself, dusts himself off, takes it off, and stands up and uh, what is he gonna do now? What am I gonna do now? He starts to walk and, and he walks for a full day after that. And uh, he starts to sit down and cry. And he sits there crying in this beautiful. And so Yvonne's walking without his horse and eventually the gray wolf comes out and catches up with him. And he says, Yvonne, why are you crying? And Yvonne says, because you ate my horse. I'm so sad. I don't know what to do. And I'm lost. And I don't know where to go. And the gray wolf says, why don't you ride on my back? I'm sorry, Yvonne. I feel bad that I've eaten your good horse. Why don't you tell me who you are and where you're going? And maybe I can help you. And Yvonne told the great gray wolf that I don't know where I'm going. I'm lost. And I'm looking for the firebird so that I could bring it back to my father. And I'm not sure where I am. And I'm lost, completely lost. And the great gray wolf said, you know what, Yvonne, I know exactly where that firebird is. And I'm gonna take you there. I'm gonna help you because I feel bad because I've eaten your horse. And so as fast as can be, the great gray wolf traveling faster than the speed of sound went to the palace of the black czar. And in that palace, there was a rookery and a beautiful rookery, palace of birds. And the wolf said, Ivan, you wait until the cover of darkness and you go, I'll tell you where the rookery is in the castle. You go there and inside that rookery, there will be the firebird perched. And there is a golden cage next to the firebird. Whatever you do, do not touch the golden cage. Bring the firebird back to me and we will go back to your father. And Yvonne says, okay, I will do what you say, great gray wolf. And so Yvonne steals into the castle, up to the rookery and sees the firebird sleeping. And he decides to take that firebird in his arms. And he walks away, but not before looking at longingly the golden cage. The golden cage captured him with his beauty, but he remembered what the wolf had said. And so he walks away. But about 10 steps outside of the rookery, he something, something pulls him back to that golden cage. And he thinks, well, how am I gonna bring my, my father, the firebird back unless I have a cage for him? And of course he should have a golden cage. And so he touched the golden cage. And as soon as he touched it, that warriors came out and arrested Ivan and took him in front of the black czar. And the black czar said, Ivan, who are you? And Ivan said, I am the prince. Ivan, my father is the white czar. And how would you like it? Uh, the black czar said, how would you like it, Yvonne, if I were to have a decree written up that you and your, f your household and your father would, would be decreed as thieves and liars for the rest of your days? How would you like that, Yvonne? Yvonne said, well, honestly, I don't think I would like that very much at all. And so the black czar said, well, Maybe you can do something for me then, Yvonne. Maybe you can do something. Maybe we can strike a deal. And Yvonne said, okay, what, what kind of deal? And the Black Czar said, in the Thrice Nine Kingdom, far from here, there is a horse with a golden mane. And I have desired this horse for longer than time has existed. And if you bring me that horse with a golden mane, I will give you the firebird. It will be as though nothing had ever happened. And Ivan said, okay, I'll take that deal. And so Ivan, empty handed, walks out of the rookery, walks out of the palace of the Black Tsar and goes to the great gray wolf. 
empty handed. And the great gray wolf says, well, what happened? Where's the firebird? You touched the cage, didn't you, Yvonne? Yvonne says, I did, and I stand guilty before you. And the great gray wolf looks at Yvonne and says, okay, I understand. You're young. You're an adolescent child. You can't, you can't, uh, you can't be blamed. I understand. And Yvonne tells him what the black czar had said, that he must retrieve the horse with the golden mane. And the great gray wolf says, you know, I actually know where that horse is. And uh, why don't you hop on my back and I will take you. I will take you to find the horse with the golden mane. Yvonne says, really? You, you know where that horse is? The great gray wolf says, I know many things, Yvonne. I know many things. And so without further ado, Yvonne jumps on the back of the great gray wolf and the great gray wolf rides faster than the wind or fast a tail is spun, but even faster great gray wolf rides. And he rides to the palace of the red czar. And the great gray wolf stops outside the palace walls and said, Ivan, get off of my back and let me tell you something. Okay, in the cover of darkness, I want you to go over here to the stables. And inside the stables, there will be stable boys, but it will be night and they will be sleeping. And inside the stables, there is the horse with the golden mane in the palace of the Red Czar. Go and get that horse and bring it back to us, and then we will leave. On the wall of the stable, there's a golden bridle. Whatever you do, don't touch the golden bridle, Ivan. Just take the horse with the golden mane. And Ivan once again says, your instructions are clear, super clear. I, I, think, I think I got it this time. I understand. Go get the horse, don't touch the bridle. And the great gray wolf says, yes, exactly, exactly. And so Yvonne, under the cover of darkness, steals as stealthily as can be into the stables. And he sees the horse with the golden mane, the horse with, with the sun of, of, of a mane, this emanating beautiful light from its mane and its tail, pure white, except for the gold of its mane and tail. And he comes up to the horse horse and he nuzzles it. He falls in love with the horse immediately. And he begins to lead the horse, had some carrots in his pocket and he, he gave the horse a carrot and you know he and the horse had a bit of a rapport. He's being very quiet because the stable boys are sleeping and he begins to lead the horse out, opens the opens the gate and and as he's passing he sees on the nail on the wall there is a golden bridle. And he remembers what the great gray wolf said don't touch the bridle, but it's so beautiful and it's gold. And what would a horse with a golden mane be without a golden bridle? Anyways, how would he lead it back to, back to the black czar to get the firebird? So he sees, checks again that the stable boys are sleeping, kind of looks around. I, I should take the golden bridle. So he, he touches the golden bridle. And as soon as he touches the golden bridle, loud bells go off because it's attached to these strings that are attached to bells and the stable boys awaken and they yell and make a big clamor and then guards come and once again Ivan is arrested and he's taken into the palace of the red czar and brought before the red czar and the red czar says who are you and he says i'm Ivan, prince of the kingdom thrice nine that way and uh and my dad's the white czar he says oh and and is it good what you have done to come into my kingdom and 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 and, and steal from me if, if you had asked me for the horse, maybe I would have just given it to you. And Yvonne says, I'm so sorry, you know, I'm trying to get this, this firebird for my dad, and, you know, and, and it's just this whole thing's going on, and, you know, I apologize. And he says, well, your apology isn't accepted. What if I have a decree drawn up saying that you and your father are liars and thieves, and I should send that to all the various kingdoms in this land? And Yvonne says, I don't think I would like that at all. I don't think I would like that at all. And the red czar, a little thin smile curls on his lips and he said, well, maybe we can strike a deal. Maybe Ivan, you're actually sent here as a blessing to me. So in a faraway kingdom, the thrice nine kingdom from here, there is a princess, a fair princess. Her name is Elena. And I have long desired her to be my wife. In all these many years, I have been unable to get her. 
If you go to that thrice nine kingdom and bring Elena to me, I will give you the horse with the golden mane as payment. A deal's a deal. Ivan shook his hand and he goes outside empty handed once again to the great gray wolf. And the great gray wolf says, Oh my God, what? What have you done this time, Ivan? You touched the golden bridle, didn't you? Ivan says, I stand guilty before you. And then Ivan tells the great gray wolf the story and how he needs to now go to the Thrice Nine Kingdom from here and get the fair, the fair princess Elena from the beautiful palace. And he doesn't know where that is and he doesn't know what to do. And of course, the great gray wolf smiles and kind of laughs and shakes his head. He says, as it happens, I actually know uh, where the fair princess Elena dwells and I can take you there and I will. So hop on my back. And as fast as the story is told, faster does the great gray wolf run. And he runs faster than the wind, faster than the rising sun rays hit the earth. He runs fast and fast he comes to the palace where the fair princess Elena dwells. But by this time he's kind of hip, he's kind of hip to his, uh, his, his, his boyfriend, uh, his friend that's a boy here, uh, Ivan, <laughs> who kind of, he can't really help himself. So he says, you know, Ivan, you seem to be kind of messing things up here and uh, digging us into a bit of a hole uh, with these kings. I'm, I'm going to I'm gonna just have you stay over here and then I'm going to go and get the Princess Elena. All right? Uh, so so you, just, you just chill in the bushes and, uh, and then, you know, I'll whistle for you when, when I've got the girl and, uh, and we can roll. And Yvonne says, all right. I mean, I'm, I'm whew, yeah, I, I, I have kind of messed things up a couple of times. I'm sorry. I've definitely gotten us into a bit of a hole here. Uh, we're woven in now with the red czar and the black czar. And, and, uh, and so, yeah, you do your thing, Wolf. You seem to have the situation under control. And the wolf kind of winks and nods. And, yeah, okay. So the wolf goes into the, the palace and, and hides in the garden where the princess Elena likes to take her evening walks with her maids and her nurses and her friends. And, and, uh, and so she's taking her walk, taking in the air, the beautiful garden air, and out from one of the bushes pounces the great gray wolf and takes Elena into his great jaws without hurting her, mind you, leaps over the garden wall, whistles to Ivan, puts Elena on his back and Ivan on his back. And more slowly now, more slowly, rides back to the kingdom of the Red Tsar. And I wonder why he decided to, to move more slowly, but, but he approaches the kingdom of the Red Tsar with the fair Princess Elena on his back. And, and, you know, I don't know if you've ever ridden on the back of a great gray wolf with a beautiful, beautiful woman, but it's, it's a bit, it's kind of romantic, you know, and uh, sparks were flying between Elena and Yvonne, um, it's kind of a once in a lifetime sort of thing, riding a wolf. Um, sure, Elena was abducted, so there's that, you know. Um, again, you know, these stories aren't too PC, uh, but, but, you know, she tends to fall in love uh, with Yvonne in return. And so <laughs> they approach the palace of the Red Guard, of the Red Tsar, and Yvonne starts to weep bitter tears. And the wolf, noticing his pelt is getting wet, and he's hearing some sobbing. He says, Ivan, what's the matter? He says, well, my friend, it's just that it's been such a wonderful voyage on your back with the Princess Elena, and, and she and I have fallen in love. I have fallen in love with her, and she has fallen in love with me, and she does not wish to go back to the palace of the Red Tsar. And I do not wish to give her up. And so the wolf thought of this and, and he said, oh, well, I might have a solution. Get off of my back. So both the princess and Yvonne get off of the wolf's back and he says, you stay here. All right, you stay here and I'm going to go into the palace and I'm going to distract the red czar. And you all, you walk ahead and, uh, and I'll catch up with you. 
You just think of me on the fourth day. He thought, well, uh, okay. And immediately the great gray wolf jumped in the air, came down on its head and became the fair princess Elena. He says, Ivan, before you go with the princess, you escort me, the fake princess to the red czar. Elena, you wait out here. Okay, this is amazing. You're a mystical beast. You're sort of a magic, a, a magic great gray wolf. And the great wolf, what did you think I was anything less? Now let's go. So Ivan takes the great gray wolf in the guise of the princess Elena to the palace of the red czar and is welcomed by the red czar. And is, the red czar is overjoyed and a wedding feast begins and, and, uh, and the red czar marries the great gray wolf in the guise of the princess Elena. Ivan is a guest at the wedding feast. But Ivan says, I, I must go, I must go. Please, please give me the horse with the golden mane as you said you would. And of course, the red czar is a man of his word and says, hey, here, take the horse with the golden mane. In fact, take the golden bridle too and speed you on your way. And so he goes out to where the princess Len has been waiting for a number of days, rides off. Third day comes, he and the princess Len are having a good time. But on the fourth day, he remembers his friend, the gray wolf, and immediately the gray wolf is by his side, back by his side. And the gray wolf says, now that you have the horse, you let Elena ride the horse with the golden mane. And Ivan, you ride on me, the great gray wolf. You ride on my back, Ivan. And Ivan says, okay. He gets off the horse with the golden mane and rides on the great gray wolf's back to the palace of the black czar, back to the palace of the black czar to make good on his promise of delivering the horse with the golden mane to the black czar in exchange for the firebird to give to his father. That's where we are. And so they're riding back, can't ride as fast again because now they have the horse with the golden mane. And as they come to the outer boundaries of the black czar's kingdom, get a little closer and closer in, Yvonne starts to weep bitter tears. And the horse says, well, what's the matter? I'm sorry. The great gray wolf says, what's the matter now? And Yvonne says, well, you know, it's just that I've always wanted a, a horse with a golden mane and, and uh, Lena really likes the horse too. And, you know, I think she likes the fact that I have this horse and I don't know, maybe she wouldn't like me as much if I didn't. And so I, I don't think we should give the horse back. I mean, I think we should keep the horse. And, and so I'm, I don't know what to do, and the horse. I mean, the great gray wolf just sort of shakes his head and, and laughs, oh, you princes, man, princes. So he says, okay. He jumps up in the air and he comes down on his head and emerges as the horse with the golden mane in the guise of the horse with the golden mane. And he says, you take me into the palace of the black czar and you offer me to the black czar. Elena, you stay out here hidden with the real horse with the golden mane. And then Yvonne, you come back out and you and Elena, you continue on your way. I'll catch up with you. Yvonne says, all right, I like this. I like this, this is good. And the great gray wolf says, okay, let's go. So they go into the palace of the black czar and um, Yvonne takes the horse with the golden mane, which is actually the gray wolf and hands him and the golden bridle to the black czar and the black czar is overjoyed and says yes yes now you shall have the firebird i'm a man of my word so he brings the firebird in the golden cage and hands it to ivan and ivan leaves with all the thanks that he can muster and he says thank you so much i'm out he goes back he meets the fair princess elena now that he has the firebird and he has the horse and he has the girl he gets on the horse with elena and rides off meanwhile in the palace of the black czar the black czar is very excited to ride his new horse and he mounts the horse after putting all the tack on the horse and he is about to spur the horse spurs the flanks of the horse and as soon as he does that the horse bucks him off and becomes the great great wolf again he mauls up the king a little bit because you don't really spur a great great wolf and nobody rides a great great wolf with a, with a saddle it's not a domesticated beast and so the great great wolf then after mauling up the king a little bit, growling at him, giving the king a big fright, leaps back over the, over the palace walls and is reunited with Elena and Ivan. And he says, Ivan, you get off that horse. You ride on me, great gray wolf. You ride on me, Ivan. And Ivan says, okay, I'll do that. And so they're riding for a long time. 
or a short time or an even longer time, they're riding. And eventually they come to the place where the great gray wolf initially met Ivan, initially killed Ivan's horse the day after the crossroads where Ivan made his fateful decision. And the great gray wolf says, all right, Ivan, jump off of my back. This is where I leave you. I'm no longer in your service. I'm no longer indebted to you. Now you go with the princess Elena and the horse with the golden mane and the firebird and you go back to your father's kingdom and you bring him all that you have found and you become the king that you are meant to be. And Ivan weeps bitter tears because he loves his friend. He loves him so much and he hugs him and he says, thank you for everything. Thank you for being such a true and great friend and for helping me to procure all of these various things. I really appreciate that. I'll never forget you. And the great gray wolf licks his face. You know, it's kind of like, oh, okay. That was a lot. And, and there he's gone. The great gray wolf is gone. And so he and the princess ride back to the palace of the white czar, his father. But before they get there, on the outskirts of the kingdom, there is a beautiful countryside where Ivan loved as a child to hunt and play and run. And he decides to take Elena camping there by this beautiful stream. They're having a great time, you know, and, and uh, they want to linger in each other's company before all of the various duties associated with royal life emerge in them. The various wedding ceremonies that have to be planned, the various events that have to be attended, the various dignitaries that have to be talked with, you know, the Instagram posts and Facebook posts and all the various social media obligations that they have to deal with now as the new king and the new queen, you know, they just, they know it's coming and they want to take a little time and they want to chill in anonymity, in togetherness, in aloneness. And who can blame them? They've been through a lot. So they camp and they're longingly looking into each other's eyes, saying amorous words that new lovers say to each other and they fall asleep. And who should come at that exact moment but Ivan's older brother Dmitri and his older brother Vasily. And they see in the distance there is a horse, a beautiful horse with a golden mane that's tied up not far from what is this? A golden bird? A fire bird in a golden cage? What's this? And so they, they're drawn closer and they see sleeping on the ground on a beautiful blanket, a fair maiden, a beautiful princess. What's this? And who's that? Runtling thing. It's, that's Ivan. Dimitri, can you believe this? Vasily, what is happening? Our bro bro, our little brother, has found the firebird, has a horse with a golden mane, and has a beautiful maiden? No. No, 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 I can't stand for this. I have a bitter taste in my mouth. I kind of feel like I want to throw up. How are you doing, Vasily? Same, you nailed it. You know, I, I totally, I think I already did throw up, honestly, in my mouth. And, and now I'm, I feel like I need some seltzer water, a LaCroix to wash it down. But we're out here in the wilderness. So let's let's get out of here. Let, let's Let's do the thing. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Yeah, I think I'm thinking what you're thinking. So they both pr pull their swords out and make a pact and they kill their brother, Ivan, in his sleep. Not only do they kill him, but they hack him into a thousand little pieces. And Elena wakes up, of course, and screams, You cowards! You cowards! Who are you to kill a man in his sleep? You're worse than cowards. You're not knights. You're not princes. You're worse than cowards. And she spits in their faces. And Dimitri draws his sword and puts it right to her neck and says, who are you and where do you come from? And how did you get with our brother? You tell me your story. How did he get this firebird? How did he get this horse with the golden mane? And so Elena, with the knife to her throat, the sword to her throat, tells the story. Dimitri and Vasily listen. And then Vasily takes his sword and puts it at Elena's heart. And he says, now I want you to swear that you'll never tell this story to anyone else. And that you'll never tell what we've done here to anyone else. This is our story now. We're taking it over. You are ours. 
And this firebird is ours and will be our fathers and this horse is ours. I want you to swear that or I'll drive this, this sword into your heart right now. And Elena swears. She liked living, you know, who can blame her? She liked the smell of jasmine on the wind. She liked the, the feeling of, of fresh linen against her clean skin. She liked taking baths with rose petals. She liked galloping in the dawn. She liked the sound of the wind through the trees. She liked life and she didn't want to die. And who can blame her? So she made the deal. And so Prince Dimitri and Prince Vasily drew straws. Who would get Elena and who would get the horse with the golden mane? Dimitri drew the straw for the horse with the golden mane. Vasily drew the straw for Elena. And they rode back to the kingdom and presented the firebird to their father. As though they were the heroes and the champions. As though they had done the deeds that were done by Ivan and the great gray wolf. And their father welcomed them back as heroes and as champions. Meanwhile, in the meadow, in the killing field, Ivan's body lay for 30 days. And on the 30th day, the great gray wolf happened by and he, he smelled Ivan because he knew his, his good friend's smell quite well. And he smelled him and, and he went looking for him. And well, all he could find was a hand here, a finger there, a toe here. Oh my God. And the wolf howled and screamed in, pair, in, in pain and despair. He didn't know what to do. He was a magic wolf, but this was beyond his magical abilities. And so he sat thinking, crying, hopeless, in despair. And at that moment, three ravens appeared, a mother and her two children. And they alighted on the killing field and began to tear at the flesh of Ivan in his various pieces. And the great gray wolf had an idea. Not only was he mad that his friend was getting eaten by carrion birds, but this gave him an idea. And so he grabbed the smallest raven in his, in his teeth and he held him in his claws. And he said to the mother raven, do you want your child to die? Mother raven said, great gray wolf, king of beasts, please do not kill my beloved youngest son. What can I do for you? And he says, you can fly from here to the thrice nine kingdom, away from here to the east. And you can bring back for me a vial of the water of death and a vial of the water of life. And you bring back that to me as fast as you can, and I will not kill your son. And with that, the raven flew off with her other son. And as fast as a tale is told, as fast as a horse gallops, as fast as the great gray wolf gallops, the raven was faster, knowing that her son's life was on the line. And she appeared back a day later with the bottles that had been requested. And so the great gray wolf holding the vial of the water of death in his hands took the raven in his mouth and chomped it in two. And the mother raven screamed and the great gray wolf took the bottle of the vial of the water of death and opened it and sprinkled it on the body of the raven. And immediately the raven's body came back together and was whole, was made whole again. And the mother breathed in and then he opened the vial of the water of life and he sprinkled that on to the raven and the raven opened its wings and flew away. And he said, yeah, this is the stuff. You brought me the good stuff. So he sprinkled the water of life. I'm sorry, he sprinkled the water of death all over the body of Ivan all over the body parts, everywhere. It took him hours and hours to find every little one. Tiny little drops, tiny little drops, tiny little drops. And eventually all of Ivan was remembered back into form, was remembered back into a being without life yet, but a body. And then the great gray wolf took the vial of the water of life and opened it and sprinkled that 
and Ivan and put some on his lips and Ivan opened his eyes and he said I have slept long and good and deeply and well and the horse said and, and, and the great gray wolf said well, are you kidding come on you're you're kidding. what what no you you were dead you were completely dead what you idiot are you kidding me you if it wasn't for me you would still be dead you would be dead forever you would be sleeping forever and, and Yvonne says oh I didn't know you know that and the great Quayle said yeah that's what time it is but that's where we've been that's what this story is about and so oh, And so Ivan and the wolf are talking and the wolf fills him in on what has happened. Look, man, your brothers betrayed you, all right? Your brothers took Elena, Elena the fair, they took the firebird, they took the horse with the golden mane and they took credit for all that you've done. And they're now at the, at the palace of your father. And this very day, Vasily is going to marry Elena. So what do you wanna do about it? Ivan says, I wanna go there. I wanna, I wanna reclaim the kingdom. For my own. I want to reclaim what, what I've earned. And so Yvonne says, get on my back. I'll take you this one last time. And so they ride into the kingdom, Yvonne on the great gray wolf's back. And they ride into the palace, Yvonne on the great gray wolf. And up the palace steps, Yvonne riding on the great gray wolf. And the guards, knowing that Yvonne is back, and the guards stepping back in awe and reverence of this magical beast this humongous wolf, greater than any being they'd ever seen, any wolf they'd ever seen, carrying Yvonne regally, royally, nobly, slowly up these steps into the feast hall where Prince Vasily and Elena were celebrating the false marriage. And into the feast hall strides the great gray wolf, into the feast hall strides Yvonne on the great gray wolf, and everyone is silent the troubadours, the tail singers, the musicians, the waiters bringing the various victuals for the feast, the children even. No one has ever seen a great gray wolf inside of a palace feast hall before, especially not being ridden by Prince Ivan. And as soon as Elena the Fair sees this, she stands up and she yells, that is my true husband, that is my true beloved, that is my true love. And the king, you can imagine, is thinking, what? What do you mean? And Elena tells the king everything. And then in that telling, Vasily and Dmitri are exposed as the liars and the thieves and the killers they are. There's various versions of this story, but this one version, Ivan forgives his brothers but not before going up to them on the great gray wolf and the great gray wolf's great teeth coming right to the face of each of them and the great jaw opening and each brother's head being placed inside the maw, the open mouth and being closed slowly and gently and slowly forcing the teeth just to indent the skull and begin to crush and stop. And each brother receives that same treatment. And each brother is sent to the dungeon for a while to think about what he had done. And that great gray wolf was, was, was in a beautiful relationship with Yvonne. And, and so Elena is married to Yvonne and they have a beautiful wedding ceremony. And they are in beautiful matrimony for the rest of their lives. And that's the story of Yvonne and the firebird, Yvonne and the gray, gray wolf. And that's the story. It's the beautiful story of Yvonne and the Firebird. 
And that's the story. So thank you so much for listening, um, everyone. And, uh, and, and I'll try to, to talk with you a little bit um, more um, about this story, basically, and some of, the, some of the archetypal themes, some of the motifs associated with story, um, with this story. Um, and so we can do that. We can talk a little bit um, if we have any more time. Um, it's about 12.15 um, for me. And, and so, yeah, this is this re-recording. I really appreciate y'all uh, coming to listen to this story, um, this rebroadcast to this, <laughs> this Zoom situation. Thank you all so much. Um, I appreciate you, you all so much. Um, and and uh, we'll go from there. All right. Thank you all. All right. Thank you all once again for sticking with it. Um, and I hope that that story uh, was enlightening for you all on some level. And so in closing, um, I just want to point to um, writesofpassagecouncil.org, which is a website that we have our offerings for the 2023 year, vision quests. And uh, I'm going to be leading uh, a Wild Heart Weekend, um, May 19th through 21st, where there will be more storytelling, more storytelling and the sort of rites of passage um, introduction um, for those of us that can't do like an 11 day vision quest encampment. Um, there's Seasons of Womanhood, um, which is a nine month program. And there's various other wonderful offerings. There's grief ritual, there's um, all kinds of things. So please go check out uh, www.ritesofpassage, R-I-T-E-S of passage.org. Um, and you'll find out um, all of those. You can meet um, guides and see bios and there's some recorded stories there, and various things like that. And so uh, we'll say that. And then also just some, some, some further thoughts, just in summation around this story. Um, you know, the story is, uh, it, you know, it's a movement story, right? It moves us as we were talking about initiatory stories before. There's a movement away from home um, and there's a movement back home. Um, and, in, and in a way, it's the location of a center in Ivan not the previous center, right? Um, which was his, his household of his father, the palace, the kingdom where he grew up, but a new center located within him, his own breast, his own self. You know, the etymology, the root of the word center is to stitch. And in some ways I conceive of this story as a stitching, um, as this thread that goes in and out of the numinous of, um, you know, when the firebird comes in, uh, to the garden, you know, he's bringing with him some beautiful thread and then he stitches it to the center of the garden when he steals those apple trees, those golden apple trees. And then he goes out and he's stitching some something back and forth between the worlds. And Ivan then has to go out in search of what? Not only of the firebird, but of gold because the firebird's eating gold. The firebird is composed of gold. Gold has, has deep symbolism, right? Gold is that, is that relationship to the self, to the soul. Gold is that relationship to the sun, the sun of the self. Um, so there's, there's some thoughts around Ivan now going out and then having to go to the various czars and being stitched into their worlds in and out. And then he goes all the way to like a, like a glacier. He goes to the terminal moraine, you know, the end point which is where Elena is found. And then he comes back and then he has to re-stitch the threads back to each Tsar, you know? Um, and so in some ways, it's also a story of this Greek, this wonderful Greek term metis, which is, you know, a word we don't really have in this language, but it's, it's, this, it's this concept of cunning and wisdom, you know? And it's the story of how Ivan gains access to his own metis. You know, he was in, in a sense a fool, like the fool starts the tarot journey. You know, he was the fool at first, the youngest child, um, easily fooled by himself in a lot of ways, touching the golden cage, touching the bridle, getting caught um, in his own desires, as we all do. Um, and then also this story seems to be about um, what we ride um, in search of those things that were stolen, that were taken, from our fathers, from our ancestral lines. So many of us come from, from peoples that came from peoples that came from peoples that were displaced, diasporas, you know, that 
that place of home stolen from our ancestors can be conceived of as gold in some ways. And what do we ride to find that in our own beings? You know, the story seems to say it's not a horse at first, you know, that, that a horse is that domesticated, known, saddled, bridled, stabled being. Um, and that, that has to be sacrificed to something older, more instinctual, more dangerous, more vital, that wolf nature that we have to ride in order to go on these adventures to find these aspects of ourselves, this wildness that has to be called forth. Um, and how is that wildness called forth? I mean, Yvonne had to sacrifice his horse, but also he had to get lost. And um, again, if we mythologize and not pathologize, all the heroes get lost in so many of the stories. They get lost, they can't find their way home. And it's the admission of this lostness that allows for the, the theophany. You know, what does that word mean? It's a big word. It means the, the, the Godhead emerging, the, the epiphany. Um, something coming into being bigger than us. And it also has a lot to do with grace. So if we admit that we're lost and we don't know where we're going and we don't know how to get there and we're searching for gold, we're, we're, we're searching for, for soul, and we cry out in our lostness, something, something comes, you know? Something emerges. For me, um, when I cried out in my lostness, uh, I was given ceremony i was given this this uh this 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 vigil this wilderness vigil this vision quest ceremony this work with rites of passage council emerged for me um, in some ways and it can be conceived of as as the old wolf that i can ride sometimes and so you know that that's part of this story um so you know we have to get lost so that we can be found found by forces larger than we are, found by, by the undomesticated aspects of our own beings. Something has to be constellated in us that isn't found in a stable, that isn't fed oats, that doesn't wear a bridle or a saddle. And so, um, you know, this story is also about resurrection. You know, Yvonne was resurrected by the wolf, by the water of life and by the water of death. Um, and. And this season that we're in, this Lenten season, the old Christian liturgical season of Lent, the calendar is a 40 day long uh, fast, right? In preparation for what? For the resurrection. And so whatever you conceive that resurrection to be, whether it be Christ or whether it be the goddess Persephone coming back from the underworld of Hades, or whether it be your own ability to resurrect your own self after having died through the winter, the resurrection of the sun, right? That comes back after, after it's, 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 it's downward spin in the Northern Hemisphere. It starts to rise again after the equinox. So, so how do we practice resurrection? That's a Wendell Berry quote. He says, practice resurrection. How do we do that? Stories seem to help us in some ways to live into that and, and help us to ask those questions, at least help me to ask those questions in my life. And, uh, and so this is a, a, a big story, a beautiful story, a great story, a story of loss, a story of, of uh, return, an initiatory story. Um, and I hope that you all continue to ask yourselves these questions throughout the days. And I hope that we all learn how to practice resurrection in our own lives. And thank you so much for your time and uh, have a blessed, blessed weekend.